Okay, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today we are excited to have Michal Kolesar from Princeton talk about finite sample optimal estimation and inference on average treatment effects under unconfoundedness. Uh, this is joint work with Tim Armstrong. Tim Armstrong is in the chat, uh, no, sorry, in Q&A to, to answer your questions. Uh, also, Michal will uh, stop from time to time to, to answer your questions. After the talk, we will have a discussion by Luke Miratrix. And then if we have some more time left, uh, we, will, we will allow for some more questions from the audience. Uh, the questions today will be handled by uh, Michael. So uh, I'm now switching over to Michael. Thanks, Dominic. So uh, like Dominic said, we have Tim Armstrong with us today to help with the Q&A. And so we will, he will be answering your questions through the Q&A feature. And we will also select a few questions to ask Michal when he pauses. So if we select your question, we will uh, ask you to raise your hand. Uh, please do not raise your hand until we ask you to do so. And uh, keep in mind that if you ask a question, it may become public through the Q&A box. So with that, I'll switch it over to Michal. So feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Um, okay, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. Um, so this is uh, Joanne Burke with Tim Armstrong. Uh, let me try and share the screen. And um, so in this paper, we look at a classic uh, causal inference problem, which is the problem of estimating average treatment effects uh, when you assume unconfoundedness. And under this unconfoundedness assumption, uh, you can um, eliminate systematic differences in outcomes between treat and control units uh, by uh, adjusting for, for the covariates, uh, for the covariate differences between uh, the treated and control units. Now, if uh, the x's are discrete, you can do this adjustment perfectly. But when the covariates x are continuous, uh, you cannot do this perfectly. And, and uh, estimation in general requires some sort of regularization. So for example, you may use matching techniques, but the matches will not be perfect. Um, or you may use other uh, smoothing techniques, such as kernel or series estimation or other non-parametric uh, techniques. Uh, all of these are going to uh, um, lead to some smoothing and, uh, or regularization, and that uh, regularization is going to cause bias in finite samples. And um, under the conventional approach to, to inference in these settings, um, you, what happens is that um, this finite sample bias disappears if, if your estimator is uh, efficient. Um, so even though there's this finite sample bias due to regularization, the conventional approach ignores this bias. Um, and what we, wanna, what we wanna do in this paper is we wanna take this finite sample uh, bias seriously and we want, as we're gonna develop estimators and um, confidence intervals that are gonna account for it explicitly. Um, so, so in order to explain what exactly we do, uh, let me just first sort of summarize how I, what I view as a conventional approach to, to uh, estimating average treatment effects under unconfoundedness, and then that'll allow me to contrast it with what, what we do in the paper. So under the conventional approach, um, as I learned it in graduate school, what you do is you pick an estimator uh, that is gonna achieve the semi-parametric efficiency bound. So that means your estimator is gonna be asymptotically unbiased, it's gonna converge at a root n rate, and it's, uh, uh, it's gonna be asymptotically normal, um, so that any finite sample bias that beta hat may have is gonna disappear, and moreover, the variance of this estimator is gonna be asymptotically as, as low as possible, though. so that's what it means that it has achieved the semi-parametric efficiency bound. Now, once I have an estimator like this, I can just simply construct uh, confidence intervals by adding and subtracting uh, from my estimator uh, 1.96, the usual critical value, times the standard error of the estimator. Um, now, as I, as I mentioned, this problem, uh, one problem with, with, with this approach is that it ignores the smoothing bias. Another issue is that it is not very good at discriminating between estimators. So, so there's many estimators that achieve the semi-parametric efficiency bound. So, um, uh, 
it's not clear exactly how to choose among them. On the other hand, there's, there are estimators that are popular in practice, such as matching estimator, nearest neighbor matching, that do not achieve the bound. And so even though these, some of these estimators, like matching estimators, may be intuitively more appealing than, than some more complicated uh, estimators that do achieve it. So for instance, you could run a 10th order kernel regression. Asymptotically, that should achieve the semi-parameter regression efficiency bound uh, should, be, should be asymptotically efficient. But uh, we do not do this in practice because we do not think that running 10th order kernel regression is going to have good finite sample properties. Uh, so using high order kernels, of of order 10 that doesn't tend to work well in finite samples. But the standard theory doesn't have anything to say about why that is. Um, the last problem I want to highlight with the standard approach is that in order to get it to work, you need a lot of smoothness. So in order for the estimator to be asymptotically unbiased, you need to assume enough smoothness on either the propensity score or the conditional mean functions. Um, and also you need to ensure that you have good overlap between the covariate distributions for the treated and control units. If you do not have good smoothness or good overlap, uh, then the, the standard theory may fail and, and it's not clear exactly uh, what to do then. So what we are gonna do in this uh, uh, paper is we're gonna, instead of sort of assuming that we have as much smoothness as we need, we're gonna start with an explicit smoothness assumption on the conditional mean of the outcome given the covariates and given the treatment. And this smoothness assumption is gonna reflect the researcher's beliefs about the, uh, the, the amount of smoothness in the data. And so if, if the researcher is only willing to say, uh, assume that the, treatment, that the conditional mean function has, is, is once differentiable, but perhaps uh, doesn't have bounded second derivatives, we can account for this explicitly. Um, and once, once we have this explicit smoothness assumption uh, at hand, we're gonna um, uh, be able to construct uh, confidence intervals and estimators that are gonna be optimal in, in, uh, in finite samples. So we're gonna do this by con considering their performance conditional on the realizations of the treatment and the covariates. Uh, so that, that is uh, one thing I will come back to that's uh, slightly different from, from what people typically do. Um, and what we're gonna do is that um, once, once I, uh, know the parameter space for the conditional mean, I can do a bias variance trade-off. So I can look at my estimator and I, I can ask, okay, what is the variance of this estimator? We're gonna look at linear estimators. So the variance of the estimator is easy to calculate. It doesn't depend on the conditional mean, but the bias of the estimator will depend on the conditional mean of the outcome given the covariates. Uh, and we can, we can bound this bias in finite samples because we uh, have uh, assumptions on, on this conditional, smooth assumptions on this conditional mean. So we are gonna be able to do a finite sample bias variance trade-off and we're gonna be able to sort of resolve this trade-off in an optimal way. It's gonna yield a unique optimal estimator. So in contrast with the standard uh, approach to estimation and inference here, the optimal estimator is gonna be unique. Um, and it will turn out that uh, for, uh, in particular cases, we are gonna be able to recover classic estimators. So we're gonna be able to, to give justifications for some classic estimators um, as we do this. Um, so for instance, if we impose a smoothness assumption that, uh, uh, that, that's Lipschitz, so we're gonna bound first derivatives uh, on, of the conditional mean, then uh, I'll sh I'll, uh, we'll be able to show that uh, if the Lipschitz cons uh, constant is large enough, then the matching estimator, nearest neighbor matching estimators uh, with a single match is, is finite sample optimal. So once we have this uh, estimator uh, at hand, we can just construct standard errors in the usual way. It's, uh, it's uh, the estimator is linear. So the standard error is just gonna be, uh, so my estimator is linear. It, it, it um, is just given by a weighted average of the, uh, of the outcomes with some weights K that these weights may depend on the treatment and covariates. But conditional on the treatment and covariates, the conditional variance of the estimator is just given by the sum of the squared weights times the, uh, times the conditional variance of the estimator. And that's easy to estimate. Uh, and uh, what's gonna be new is that in order to construct confidence intervals, we're gonna not add and subtract 1.96 as the critical value times the standard error, but we're gonna use a larger critical value that's gonna explicitly take into account the potential bias of the estimator. So in, in the empirical application that uh, I'm gonna show you 
towards the end of the toggle, this, this uh, critical value is going to be much higher than 1.96. So it's, it, uh, depending on the specification, it's going to be between 3 and 4. And all specifications is going to be larger than 3. And this is going to reflect the fact that, uh, uh, that we're, we're explicitly taking into account uh, that the bias in finite samples of, of our estimator may be non-negligible. The nice thing about this finite sample approach is that we're going to avoid having some issues that, that arise in the standard theory. Uh, for instance, uh, our construction is going to be the same whether or not we have a lack of overlap. If we have lack of overlap, then the critical this is going to be reflected through the larger critical value uh, because lack of overlap leads to bias, but we're taking that into account explicitly. But we don't have to sort of change our estimator or change, change uh, anything in our construction. Um, So we're also, uh, although most of our results are finite sample, we're also going to be able to derive some new asymptotic results. So first of all, we're going to derive minimal smoothness uh, conditions for achieving the semi-parametric efficiency bound when you condition on the uh, treatments and covariates. So um, essentially, the bound's going to uh, require you, uh, in order to achieve the semi-parametric efficiency bound, uh, it's going to be necessary for you to bound the derivative of order uh, of the dimension of covariates over two. So say if you have uh, 10 covariates, you're going to have to bound the derivative of, over, uh, of order five. That may not be uh, so appealing in application to sort of impose bounds on the fifth derivative of the conditional mean function. In such cases, if you're not willing to do that, uh, the semi-parameter efficiency bound is not going to be uh, attainable. And any estimator that you may uh, want to come up with is going to have a bias that's not going to uh, disappear asymptotically. And in such cases, our techniques, our finite sample bias correction techniques are going to persist even in, in large samples. Um, I'm also, uh, so as I'm going to build up this theory, um, I'm going to show you that sort of the same approach to constructing confidence intervals is going to apply to any linear estimator. So for any linear estimator, you can just construct confidence intervals by using this larger critical value that takes account um, takes into account the bias uh, of the of the estimator. But as I'll show, um, one disadvantage of using any linear estimator is that asymptotic normality may may, may fail in uh, in some settings. So I'm going to show this. Uh, for example, for the matching estimator, if there's weak overlap. In contrast, uh, if you choose these weights k optimally, uh, then we'll show that uh, for the optimal estimator, um, uh, as, you know, if you, it, asymptotic normal is always going to obtain even under, under weak overlap. Uh, so our paper builds on a, on a a uh, large number of, of, of papers that think about uh, alternative asymptotics in, in this uh, classic settings of, for estimating uh, treatment effects under unconfoundedness. We're also going to build upon uh, some of, uh, some of uh, earlier work by, by Dave Donahoe. I'm not going to have time to go through all of these papers, but there's just want to flag that, that we're where we're building on, uh, on a large, larger literature. So let me uh, set up uh, the model just to, to clarify exactly what, what is the setting we have in mind. And once I have the model set up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how, how our uh, uh, approach to estimation and inference works. So um, the setup is going to be that, that we're going to observe uh, covariates that I'm going to uh, call X, uh, a treatment indicator D, and an outcome uh, that's going to correspond to the potential outcome under treatment if the on observation is actually treated and uh, to the potential outcome under no treatment if the uh, observation is not treated. So I'm going to use this uh, Rubin uh, notation of uh, uh, Y1, Y0 to denote potential outcomes. We're going to, for most of the talk, I'm going to condition on the realizations X, uh, D of, of the treatment and covariates so that when you see expectations, unless I explicitly say otherwise, these are all expectations that are conditional on covariates and treatment. Um, so conditional on covariance and treatment, the outcome is going to uh, have a conditional mean F. So this is just the conditional mean of the outcome given the covariance and treatment. So I'm going to call that conditional mean F. So that by definition, this residual UI is going to have mean zero. So, uh, and, and we're going to assume that the observations are independent. So these views are independent. So, so uh, 
we essentially just have a, a, a fixed design regression model. So fixed design because I'm thinking of these X's and these uh, fixed. And it's non-parametric because I do not want to make uh, parametric assumptions on it. And in order to go on, obtain uh, finite samplers, as I'm going to further assume that uh, these U's are normal with known variance function sigma squared, I'm going to be able to, we're going to be able to drop this normality assumption and the assumption that the uh, means are, that the variances are known, um, in which case some of the finite sample results will sort of translate into analogous uh, asymptotic results. Um, so our parameter of interest is going to be the conditional average treatment effect. So uh, uh, what I have in mind, uh, since the, uh, sometimes the terminology is confusing in this literature, uh, what I'm in interested in estimating is the um, average treatment effect conditional on the realization of, of the covariates for the ith unit, and I'm going to average this across all units. Um, so relative to the usual unconditional average treatment effect, here I'm conditioning on the covariate values, and then I'm going to I'm taking the empirical average here uh, rather than the population average of these of these covariate values. Um, but uh, as I'll show you uh, later, our our technique is going to generalize to to inference on on the av unconditional average treatment effect as well. Uh, it's just that in that case we do not have finite sample results. But what's uh, important at this point is that the parameter of interest here. I can express it as just a simple function, as a, as, a, as a simple linear functional of the conditional mean function f. So I'm going to, so, so it depends on this conditional mean f, and I'm going to call it uh, L of f just to give it a name. Now the key assumption in our setting is that um, I know the parameter space for f. So for instance, if I, uh, uh, I, I know that the conditional mean has bounded derivatives, so it's Lipschitz, so that if I take a difference between f of x uh, evaluated, uh, f of x devaluated at x and tilde x, the difference between them is going to be bounded by a, some constant, which is known to me, times the distance between x and x tilde. Um, so, um, so that's going to be the key assumption, and I'm going to assume that uh, this, this set script f, this parameter space for the conditional mean is convex and symmetric. Uh, so now may be a good time maybe to uh, pause for questions. Uh, we don't have any questions at this time, so maybe you should uh, keep going. Okay. Um, okay, so, so, so with this setup, how do, I, uh, how do we construct uh, optimal uh, estimators and confidence intervals? So first, I'm going to start out by focusing on linear estimators. So, uh, you give me some linear estimator, I'm going to call it uh, L hat K. So K denotes these weights. So it's just a weighted average of the outcomes. Um, and I'm going to think about with this linear estimator with a given weights, I'm going to think about how do I construct a, a, a confidence interval that takes into account the potential bias uh, of this estimator. Once I know how to do this, I'm going to then think about the question, how do I choose these weights K in an optimal manner? So, because the estimator is linear, uh, the standard deviation of the estimator is uh, simple to calculate. It's just going to be given by the sum of the squared weights times the uh, uh, conditional variances. Remember, I, uh, I'm assuming I know these conditional variances, so, so this standard deviation is known. I can calculate it uh, directly. Uh, what is the bias of the estimator? Well, uh, the expectation of my estimator is just uh, the expectation of uh, y conditional on the x's and d's times k summed over all i's, so, so, so that's this first piece here, uh, minus the object of interest, uh, L of f, the conditional average treatment effect, so that this is the bias. Um, I do not know what the bias is exactly because I do not know what this conditional mean function f is, but I can uh, bound it because I know the parameter space for the conditional mean function, so I can calculate the bias under all po uh, possible conditional means and the worst case bias is just going to be given by the maximal bias over all the possible biases. Um, so once I know uh, the uh, worst case bias, I can construct one-sided uh, one confidence intervals uh, by simply adjusting for the, uh, for the worst case bias. So in, instead of just subtracting the one-sided critical value times the standard uh, deviation of the estimator from, from my estimate, I'm also going to subtract off the worst case bias. And this is going to ensure that no matter what the true uh, conditional uh, mean function f turns out to be, 
uh, I'm always gonna I'm 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 always gonna uh, account for for the bias by using this worst case bias. So I'm gonna have finite sample coverage under normal errors. Uh, um, that's going to be equal to at least uh, the nominal level. Uh, for two-sided confidence intervals, I could uh, use a similar approach by adding and subtracting the worst case bias in addition to adding and subtracting the two-sided critical standard, two-sided critical value times the standard deviation. But this is a little bit conservative because the bias cannot simultaneously be large and positive and large and negative. So instead, um, we can we can sort of shrink the uh, length of the confidence interval by a little a little bit by noticing that um, the t statistic, um, if I subtract off uh, the uh, the parameter of interest, the conditional average treatment effect um, from my estimator and divide by standard deviation, is going to be distributed uh, normally with variance one and mean that I can bound because I can bound the uh, bias, and uh, so by using a critical value that's based on, on an absolute value of a normal distribution um, would mean uh, T bar, where T bar denotes the worst case bar standard devi deviation ratio, I can, uh, I can shrink this slight, uh, slightly conservative uh, in interval by a little bit. So, so this is going to uh, be the confidence interval uh, that we're going to use. So if, if this um, worst case bias to standard deviation ratio is large, so it's say bigger than one and a half for 95% confidence intervals, uh, this confidence interval is essentially the same as the one uh, above, except that we're using once uh, critical values here that are very close to one-sided ones. So reflecting exactly the fact that the bias cannot simultaneously be large and positive and large and negative. Um, okay, so, so this is how I construct uh, confidence intervals that are gonna have finite sample coverage based on a linear estimator where you give me the set of uh, weights. Now I want to uh, consider a question, how do I choose these weights optimally? So if I want a confidence interval with a short length, I can just uh, uh, look at the length of my confidence interval. Uh, that's going to depend, the length of the confidence interval is going to depend on the worst case bias of my estimator. It's going to depend on the standard deviation of the estimator. Um, and so for any, uh, so I can compute it ex ante. It doesn't depend on the outcome data. And I can then uh, try and uh, minimize the, this length of the confidence interval over the potential weights k. If I was interested in point estimation, I can look at, I can minimax the mean squared error. I can, so the worst case mean squared error is given by the worst case bias squared plus standard deviation squared. Again, uh, these just depend on the worst case bias of my estimator and the standard deviation of the estimator. Um, I can, again, try and minimize this quantity over the, uh, over the uh, weights. Uh, k. So in particular, in, because uh, all of these criteria depend on the weights only through the worst case bias and standard deviation of the estimator, it suffices to, uh, to sort of trace out the worst case bias variance frontier. So, so um, what I mean by this is that I'm going to impose a bound on the variance, and then I, what I can do is, given subject to some bound V on the variance of my estimator, I can try and find weights that minimize the worst case bias. And then I can vary this uh, variance bound V to trace out the, uh, the, uh, the different bias variance trade-offs that I can uh, uh, pick between. And then I can just choose a, a point on this bias variance uh, frontier that is gonna be optimal for the given criterion, for example, mean squared error or, or the length of the confidence interval. So this is the same idea as uh, when you're doing bias variance trade-off in say non-parametric uh, density estimation, but uh, the difference is uh, that we're doing it here in finite samples because this worst case bias is, is reflecting the actual uh, finite sample bias of, of the estimator. Now this looks like a potentially a complicated uh, optimization problem, but it turns out that um, using some results from, from uh, earlier papers, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, cast this optimization problem as just a convex optimization problem. So uh, the, this is the formula for the convex optimization problem. The details are not super important. I just want to, uh, sort of, there's uh, just a couple of features that I want to highlight. The reason that the optimization problem is convex is that the parameter space uh, F is, is assumed to be convex. Um, and then, um, 
uh, this uh, convex optimization problem is indexed by a uh, smoothness parameter delta that you can think of uh, as, as, uh, as some sort of a bandwidth parameter. So it's putting the relative weight on the, on, on the, on the, on the, on the variance of the estimator when I'm tracing out the bias variance trade-off. So uh, this, by solving this convex optimization problem and a varying delta, I can trace out uh, the class of optimal estimators that trade off bias and variance optimally uh, in the sense that each member of, of this uh, class, L hat delta, is going to minimize the worst case uh, uh, bias subject to a bound on variance. <clears throat> um, and as delta varies, this bound on the variance varies. And so once I have this class of optimal estimators, um, I can just pick the optimal delta, the bandwidth-like parameter, uh, by just checking um, which of these deltas leads to uh, a confidence interval with the shortest length, or which of these deltas leads to a, an estimator with the, uh, with the best, best uh, mean square there, so, uh, which is just a, a single uh, dimensional optimization problem. Um, so, um, I just wanted to sort of flesh out uh, some of the details. I, I want to show you how this uh, plays out when uh, the parameter space is given by Lipschitz constraints. So in this case, we actually, this convex optimization problem um, becomes a problem of, of minimizing a quadratic objective subject to linear constraints. And if you think about that, that sounds uh, an awful lot like the lasso uh, or least angle regression algorithm. Uh, so that there the problem is exactly the same. And in fact, we, uh, we, uh, there, the, the problem is, is um, very similar and, and, and we're, we were able to come up with an algorithm that sort of, that is similar to this lasso uh, algorithm um, that traces out the, the, this optimal bias variance frontier as a function of delta and, and it's piecewise linear, just like the lasso uh, solution path. The solution path here as I vary delta is gonna be also piecewise linear. Um, and the solution takes this uh, intuitive form where um, uh, essentially what the optimal estimator ends up doing is it ends up uh, 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 using the actual outcome uh, as the prediction for what would happen to observation I under treatment uh, that it actually received. And he uses this counterfactual uh, outcome uh, estimate for what would happen to me if I had uh, if my treatment status was the opposite of what I had received, which is given by a weighted average of observations uh, that did actually receive op the opposite treatment status. And these weights correspond to um, the Lagrange multipliers on these Lipschitz constraints. Um, but the important point uh, I uh, think to note here is that it's just a weighted average of, of outcomes uh, uh, under uh, receiving uh, of observations uh, receiving the opposite treatment status that I did. Um, so that sounds an awful lot like a matching estimator, except these uh, weights are not necessarily zero one. Uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that there is actually a closer connection in particular, um, if uh, the Lipschitz constant uh, C is, is, is uh, large enough, um, then the optimal estimator only puts, uh, puts uh, non-zero weight on one of the observations that uh, receives opposite treatment status, namely the one that's closest. So uh, in, in other words, the optimal estimator, if this uh, Lipschitz constant C is large enough, is actually the matching estimator with a single match. Uh, the important thing to note here is that in order for the matching estimator to be optimal, you need to use the same matching mat metric as the one that's defining the uh, smoothness of the conditional mean function. So, so that's going to be important. So whatever the matching metric is, uh, it needs to correspond to the metric that you uh, used to define the Lipschitz uh, uh, constraint on the conditional mean function. So, so far I showed you how to construct uh, linear estimators with the best possible weights and uh, confidence intervals based on these linear estimators. It turns out that um, this is not, not restrictive. So there's some, uh, we discussed in the paper that these, um, these uh, confidence intervals and estimators are actually, uh, there's a sense in which they're nearly efficient among all procedures, not just, not just linear ones. Okay, so, so 
Um, so, so far, everything I've said has been under the assumption that uh, I know the conditional uh, variance function um, and I know that the errors are normal. Um, in practice, this is typically unknown. So, in order to implement our uh, procedure in practice, um, what you can do is to just replace the unknown uh, conditional variance function with an estimate. Um, so, to make the method sort of as simple as possible, we suggest uh, using a homoscedastic variance estimate uh, as your initial variance estimate. Uh, then, then do this uh, optimal vari bias variance trade-off, but when reporting uh, the final confidence interval, use heteroscedastic robust standard errors. This is analogous to using uh, ordinary least squares in linear regression, uh, but then heteroscedastic robust standard errors. This, uh, so in analogy to that, this, uh, this procedure is going to be efficient under homoscedasticity, uh, but uh, it's, the confidence intervals are going to be valid even, even uh, when the homoscedasticity assumption is, is relaxed, uh, including, including under lack of overlap, as we show in the paper. Um, Now, if the errors are not normal, uh, you may be, the estimator is not gonna be exactly normal because um, it's a weighted average of outcomes that are not now uh, necessarily normal. Um, but we show in the paper that, that's, that the no estimator is gonna be normal asymptotically because these weights uh, are gonna be asymptotically guaranteed to be uh, not too big for any individual observation so that the central limit theorem applies. Now, you may worry about uh, this result being an asymptotic result, um, and so you may worry that it doesn't apply in finite samples. If you're worried about that, you can uh, directly uh, compute how big the weights are. So you can compute this diagnostic where you look at the maximum squared weight relative to the sum of the squared weights. Uh, this, this quantity that I'm calling lint K for Lindeberg uh, is necessary for the Lindeberg condition to, to hold, to, to get a central limit theorem. You can compute it directly in any application to check uh, how accurate the central limit approximation may be in, in, a finite, in a given finite sample. As I'll show you in our application, these weights are indeed small for our optimal estimator, but not necessarily, uh, uh, they turn out not to be so small for the matching estimator. Um, for, for other estimators, these weights uh, are not guaranteed to be, uh, to be uh, small. So the other uh, uh, issue that may come up in practice is that uh, the confidence intervals I've constructed uh, here are for the conditional average treatment effect. You may be interested in the population average treatment effect that doesn't uh, condition on the covariates. Um, so that is, uh, it's possible to extend our method to cover this case as well. All you have to do in this case is just to use the marginal variance of, our est of, of the estimate estimator rather than the conditional variance of the estimator. And uh, the trick that I showed you uh, by use, uh, that, that allowed us to get a tighter confidence interval by realizing that bias cannot be simultaneously large and positive and large and negative doesn't work anymore here because now the bias uh, is a conditional bias of the estimator. And, and now that I'm thinking about the x's as random to get a, an average treatment effect, I cannot uh, take advantage of the uh, fact that it's a fixed quantity, so it can't be, uh, so, so this construction doesn't, doesn't work anymore, but you can uh, simply construct the confidence interval by adding and subtracting the worst case conditional bias uh, times the usual two-sided critical value times, uh, times this marginal standard error rather than the conditional standard error. So that's how you can get confidence interval for the uh, population average treatment effect. Uh, the other practical issue uh, that is gonna come up is that the appropriate cho choice of, of uh, is, is that you're gonna need to choose an appropriate parameter space for the conditional mean function. Um, in uh, some of the examples, I stressed the Lipschitz smoothness condition that may not be always uh, desirable. So uh, one worry you may have about it is that the Lipschitz smoothness condition uh, requires you to bound slopes of the conditional mean function. You may not wanna do that. One option in that case is to bound higher derivatives. Uh, another simple option is to just um, is to just uh, say that uh, to impose the Lipschitz condition after taking out the best linear predictor. So uh, that's that's this smoothness class here. 
it turns out that in this case, we get an analog of our, uh, of our result that the matching estimator is optimal if this uh, Lipschitz uh, constant C is large enough. And the analog of result here is that uh, here, if the Lipschitz smoothness condition is large enough uh, on, the, on this residual after taking out the best linear predictor, uh, the estimator that's optimal is, is the regression adjusting matching estimator with a single match. Um, let me uh, skip this and uh, pause for questions. Uh, sure, yeah, I have a question. So um, could you give us a sense of how large the Lipschitz constant needs to be for the matching estimator to be optimal? Are these sort of you know, reasonable sizes for the Lipschitz constant or? or yeah, so you, that's a great question. A it's going to depend on the application. So uh, um, perhaps the best way of answering this question is to just show you our application and we actually uh, com compute how large the Lipschitz constant needs to be in the application. You can then tell me whether you think that's too large or, or reasonable. But it will, it will vary uh, depending on, on the application. So, uh, so, uh, so let, me, let me show you maybe the application and, and uh, uh, if it's still unclear after that, we, we, can, we can discuss it. Okay, great, yeah. Um, and there are no other questions at this time. Okay, so, so the application that we uh, use is, is this classic ap application to national supported work demonstration. That's the uh, data set from Lalon and uh, the Heiji Awaba. So as our treated sample, we use uh, 185 men who received job training. And as our untreated sample, we use uh, data from the PSID. So uh, these individuals were not part of the NSW, uh, NSW um, uh, experiment. Um, and now the goal is gonna be uh, to, uh, to estimate the average treatment effect uh, for these 185 men. So switching gears slightly, uh, the uh, goal is now uh, inference on the conditional average treatment effect on the treated but everything that I said about the average treatment effect for the whole population is, is just gonna apply for, for this estimate with uh, obvious adjustments. So as, as covariates, we use the same covariates as uh, the Heji and Waba, namely age education, black Hispanic indicators, indicator for marriage, uh, past earnings and past employment indicators. And now, um, the key in implementing our method is gonna be uh, imposing this uh, Lipschitz smoothness class and, and picking this Lipschitz smoothness constant C. So the way we do it in the application is, is that uh, we uh, normalize this Lipschitz smoothness constant C to be one in our, in, in our baseline. And in, uh, instead to reflect our smoothness uh, assumptions on the conditional mean, we're gonna use a weighted norm here. So if I think that the conditional mean is smoother with respect to a particular covariate XJ, that's gonna be reflected through this weight AJ uh, J in the, in, the, in the norm. And the way we pick these, nor, uh, we pick these weights is, is just reflecting our a priori bounds on, 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 uh, on the conditional mean slopes uh, when I, uh, with respect to the partial derivatives. Uh, so for instance, uh, here, uh, the, uh, uh, j just as an example, uh, so, so the outcome here is earnings. Um, if I look at, say, the black indicator here, uh, two and a half uh, means that uh, if I change uh, the person from uh, black to white, their earnings are going to uh, change by at most two and a half thousand dollars. So same for Hispanic and married. So as a, to give you an idea, the, uh, the average earnings for the treat example here are seven and a half thousand dollars. So these are pretty, pretty uh, generous uh, bounds. Uh, the, uh, indicator the, the coefficients associated with earnings are chosen to allow for a one-to-one -one earnings response. Uh, so if I change your past earnings in both uh, 1974 and 1975 by X units, uh, your outcome today is, is or your income today is also is allowed to increase by at most X units on average as well. Um, so, so here, uh, uh, um, all of the action is through this uh, choice of these uh, weights A. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna vary uh, the Lipschitz smoothness constant C uh, to, to make these bounds uh, tighter or less tight and uh, to see how the results are gonna 
are going to change. Uh, so here, here are the main results. Um, so, um, so just to give you a, a, a comparison, uh, we're going to uh, uh, this table is reporting uh, results for the optimal estimator as under this feasible implementation where I re replace the uncon uh, unknown uh, ver conditional variance with, with an estimate uh, to a matching estimator. Uh, where the number of matches is chosen optimally for a given criterion, just like uh, choosing this bandwidth-like parameter delta for the optimal estimator. So uh, it, for the matching estimator, it turns out that uh, matching with a single match uh, is best for the mean squared error, and matching with 18 matches is uh, best for confidence interval length, for instance. So. Um, the matching estimates are a little bit higher than our estimates, so of the order of $1.4 thousand uh, dollars uh, uh, for the treatment effect. The worst case bias, um, the, uh, in all, uh, for all the specifications, however, is quite large relative to the standard error here. So in all cases, it's bigger than one, as you can see here. And so this is going to mean that, that the bias is actually uh, non-negligible and uh, our confidence intervals reported here are reflecting this through using this uh, through usage of this larger critical value. Um, the uh, uh, confidence intervals for the population average treatment effect are only slightly larger. Um, that's just coming from the fact of uh, that we're using this slightly uh, more conservative uh, construction. The difference between the conditional variance and the marginal variance is essentially negligible here in, in this application. The last thing I want to uh, point out is, is these Lindeberg weights K. Um, so as I, uh, as I uh, promised, our, our theory guarantees that the Lindeberg weights for the optimal estimator should be small in large samples. And that's indeed the case in this application. They're of the order of 0.07 or 0.06 but they're not uh, small for the matching estimator. So for the matching estimator, largest Lindbergh weight is 0.2. And that comes from the fact that uh, there is not very good overlap in the data. And so some, of, some observations end up serving as a match for many, many other observations. And if you end up serving as a match for many other observations, the estimator puts a lot of weight on, on you. Um, and that means that uh, the central mean theorem approximation for the matching estimator here is, is, is potentially questionable because you're putting a lot of weight on a single observation. If that single observation, the error for this, this single observation is not normal, then the average is not going to be approximately normal either. Um, so uh, as, a, as a sensitivity check, what we do uh, uh, is we sort of look at how the results vary as, as this choice of C varies. Um, and you can see that the optimal estimate is very stable for, for as we vary C, it only sort of weird things start happening when C is very small and the estimate turns negative. That is because uh, it, the raw difference between the treated and, uh, and controlled outcomes is negative. So there, if I'm just not adjusting for covariates, I get a negative treatment effect estimate. Uh, just because people in the PSID in the control sample, they on, on average make a lot more money than people in the control group. And choosing C to be very small just essentially uh, would be saying that that covariate differences don't matter re very much and that that is what the uh, estimator ends up incorporating. Um, but uh, unless you choose an unreasonably small uh, value of C, uh, the estimate is pretty stable between, uh, running between 0.9 and 1.1. Um, so that suggests that we're, we're uh, taking into account selection on observables. And to answer the earlier question about uh, how big C needs to be in order for the matching estimator to be optimal. So as I said, uh, if I, I don't have the results here, but they're reported in the paper for our baseline specification uh, when C is equal to one, uh, the matching estimator is about 90% efficient relative to the optimal estimator. So, uh, and the efficiency increases with C um, I think it's, uh, it goes up to 95 at C equal to uh, two and a half. So um, I guess uh, you could probably interpret it either way in terms of, of this uh, result of, of, of matching being optimal. So, okay, so let me, let me stop here. All right.
right. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Michal. Um, we're now switching over to discussion. So we will have uh, Luke Miratrix present some slides. Then uh, Michal can, uh, can respond to that. And after that, uh, we will take some more questions if we have time allows. Um, like different to before, uh, if you have a question uh, that you want to ask in person afterwards, just raise your hand. So I repeat, you don't have to submit via Q&A, just raise your hand if you want to and ask a question uh, after the discussion. All right, uh, so now let's switch over to Luke uh, whenever you're ready. Great, uh, let me just share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes. Great. Uh, so thanks for the, um, I, I was glad to have the excuse to read this paper and to think about it. Um, I, the, the paper itself is incredibly dense. There's like a million ideas packed in it. I sort of, I think just got some of the surface ideas, which is what I'm going to primarily focus on in these comments. Um, oh, I can't see my slides because of the little vision thing. So my takeaway, um, there's sort of like there's two main ideas is, um, and I'm just going to repeat these ideas to see how wrong I am. I look forward to being corrected. But the first idea is if you somehow obtain using matching or whatever, um, a collection of weights for units and a statement of how much you think that the response function, the relationship between Y and covariates, both on the treatment and control sides is wiggly, you can find, you can sort of do this optimization to find the worst case F in terms of the weights you pick. So basically you do some matching and then there's going to be the worst case response function that is gonna make your uh, matching the worst idea uh, possible given the constraints of the function. Given that, you could uh, make something like a confidence interval, which I'm gonna call a capture interval. The confidence interval in, in a nice world is driven by uncertainty or randomness. If you have the right F, then the error is gonna be basically estimation. It's you have this residual variation of your Y around F. In the nasty world, we have uncertainty as before, but we also have this non-random bias term. We know we can be systematically off and so the solution is we're gonna just push that bound into our interval. And so our intervals are gonna be wide enough so that our non-random bias term and our random uncertainty term, uh, we know that the truth is gonna be somewhere in that interval. So we're confident that that interval has captured the truth. Um, so we can use this for good uh, inference, I think, using any sort of matching or whatevs that you have weights for. Um, so that's sort of like the, the first idea. And then that gives rise to the second idea, which is the main idea, which is given that you have weights that can identify the worst case bias and consequently the worst case capture interval, you say, okay, I want weights that make my worst case capture interval the smallest. So you're gonna do this optimization problem to find the weights that make your capture interval the narrowest, and then you're in business. Um, so we're finding weights to make our interval look good. So this is actually implementing, in a sense, some sort of matching or um, observational study uh, uh, evaluation. So I think of this as like we've created the lasso of truth. We're identifying a range of values that encircles the true ATE or um, CATE. And then the question is, what's driving the width of this range and how strong are these assumptions? So assumptions, this whole paper is a framework where we have different assumptions. So it's a different deal with the devil, right? We, we're used to a lot of the classic deals with the devil. We've now shifted. We're moving and talking about some other assumptions and which deal is better, which deal is worth it. And that's where I'm really interested in this paper because it's like proposing a new approach. And now we have to ask ourselves which approach is really sort of the more fragile. All of the observational study stuff is fragile. Let's, let's talk about this contrast. So here is just a list of some assumptions uh, or, or sort of um, things that we need to make things work. Uh, the things that jumped out at me is I, we still need our selection on observables because what we're doing here is we're dealing with residual imbalance beyond exact matching. So I think using this method, if we had exact matching were possible, then we wouldn't have the bias term anymore because um, we would basically be able to say everything is gone. But it's when we have imbalance that we're trying to get a handle on that. And to make that work, we basically are saying that our function is smooth. So this sort of steps back of like, this is in a sense, why do we match? Um, and so there's this philosophy that I think this work is really interested in, which is there's this anti-match camp, which says, oh, just model response for surface matching is inefficient. It's annoying. Um, ACIC contest 
constantly show that just modeling the response surface is way better than matching. And then the matching people, on the other hand, are saying matching is intuitive. We don't like to say things about the response surface. We don't like to use the outcomes. Matching tells us when we don't have overlap. What's interesting about this work is it's matching fundamentally. We're not using the outcomes in the process, but it's driven by statements about the outcome model in a very explicit way. And there's something quite pleasing about that. So here is um, our just one comment that's interesting about this paper that I haven't quite wrapped my mind around as they say it's finite sample, but really what it is is they're setting up a regression model. X is fixed, D is fixed, therefore the weights are fixed because the weights are a function of X and D. So randomness is purely driven by the residuals, which means we have some sort of either a, a residual process or we're thinking of a controlled individually stratified sample from an infinite population. So there's something interesting there that I just wanted to flag. Here's just a picture that I had to draw for myself of what the Lipschitz uh, condition really is saying. We're basically saying we have this function. We know unit K and unit J. We, can, we, we know that we have them in the bag and we have unit I, which is a treated unit. K and J are control units. So how far away from K and J could the counterfactual for uh, unit I be? The Lipschitz condition sort of controls that, setting aside the noise issue. So that's really what's going on with the Lipschitz as far as I can tell. Um, in terms of maximizing the imbalance and bias. And now we try to come up with a function that sort of pushes the function as high as possible and then as low as possible to sort of move our control and treatment um, averages as far apart or um, in either direction. So that's what's going on behind the scenes, I think. So then how strong is the Lipschitz condition? Well, one issue is as dimension goes up, the norm is going to go up as square root of the dimension, which means that constant C is going to have to go down as the covariates go up. Otherwise, we're not going to have no control over the marginal um, marginal dif differences. So if we just think about like X, the first X, as Z goes up to control overall um, the, the differences in any individual thing, we need to have that C shrink. So which makes me think that even a moderately sized C with a reasonable number of dimensions is maybe a, a very, um, is very lax. So you need to keep that C small, which might be a very strong assumption. So um, just, this is, I'm gonna skip this. This is sort of, where do we get that C? We wanna keep it small. Can we do sample splitting to use data to sort of drive that C? How do we sort of get a sense of what smoothness really is? Um, the, the, the piece about one-to-one -one matching, I think the argument is simple, which is in an uncertain world, the best counterfactual is the closest. If your C is large enough, then anything further away can basically be so much worse that it just drives out any uh, gains of variance. So, and, and then what does this say about how tight our worst case is? So I think the fact that we end up with one-to-one -one matching is saying something about, about that constant C and how we have to control it and when it's small, what does that actually mean? Now, all of this is said, listening to the talk today, I realized that there's this secret piece that was mentioned in the talk, which I think is super important, which is you can actually control the second derivatives, which means that you can allow for things like differential trends. I was tripping up on something like having a pretest where you know that there's a strong relationship between Y and X. And then if you want to, but you don't really care about that, you care about diverging relationships between Y and X between the treatment and the control. So possibly um, looking at second derivatives or something could get a better handle on that. So um, the weights are controlling the, the, the worst case, um, but is I'm not seeing the extrapolation and ah, I need my slide. Hold on just a second. Oh yes, that's what that slide is. I couldn't see the title, so I threw myself off. Um, so I'm not seeing extrapolation. I think the in interpolation is implicit, uh, not quite with one-to-one -one matching. So is it possible to incorporate a modeling step um, to, to sort of handle the adjustment? I, I think that in the talk, uh, Mikhail said that higher order derivatives are doing this. I just didn't follow that piece. And if that's the case, I would bring that out and foreground it more in the paper. It seems so important. Uh, and then finally, with the bias variance uh, frontier, can, can we see, so there's that uh, delta parameter in the optimization. Can we actually do the calculations to sort of see what proportion of the bias, uh, worst case, is our confidence interval? That might be interesting for diagnosing what's happening with our matching. And then finally, a couple of quick questions for the application. Um, are the bounds, um, like mainly I'm curious, the stability, you say that the stability in the point estimate selects that selection on observables has been captured. I did, just didn't quite follow that. 
All right, so my takeaway is quite an interesting paper. Uh, by making claims as to the outcome model without looking at it, we can identify what's giving us a worst case scenario. That's really neat. But going back to that anti-matching cap, outco actual outcomes tell us a lot. Can we bring those out actual outcomes into this process, get a little bit of strength, uh, maybe like residualize things and then do this whole process on the residuals or, or something like that uh, to then really control bias that might allow us to reduce the C or something and, and then get uh, tighter intervals. Mainly, it's refreshing to see new ideas into the uh, introduced in the matching world. That's always fun. But I have to say, matching uh, causal inference, everything is about optimization, all the new work. So I, I wish I had paid more attention in my optimization class when I was in grad school. So thank you all very much. Um, I, again, thank you for having the opportunity to read and discuss this paper. I hope these comments uh, are thought provoking um, to at least somebody. So. Thanks for the great discussion, Luke. Uh, Michal, do you want to uh, respond? Um, yeah, thanks. That that was an excellent discussion. Lots uh, lots of questions in there. I don't think I have time to respond to all of them, but um, maybe let me let me just respond to a, a few of them by um, sort of going back to my slides. Um, so one of the questions you ask is. Um, um, uh, can we see in the confidence interval what proportion comes from the bias? And uh, I didn't have time, I, I guess I was speeding up towards the end, um, so I didn't properly explain this picture. So what I'm plotting here, uh, here the estimate is this uh, orange line, sort of plotted as, as I vary C, so these are, these are the range of estimates. And these, uh, these lines, uh, these uh, dotted and the solid lines, these are confidence intervals for the population average treatment effect and for the conditional average treatment effect. And what I did not say, but I should have said is that uh, this shaded region uh, 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 depicts the estimate plus or minus the worst case bias exactly to give you an idea of, of how much of the confidence interval with is due to these bias issues and how mm. much is it just due to uh, random sampling error. So, so here you can see that about a half the width of the, of the confidence interval comes from the bias and about a half of it comes from, uh, from just sampling variability. Uh, and the other, uh, I, I think question you asked Luke about uh, what I, why did I say that uh, because the estimate is uh, stable as a function of CY, does that suggest we're capturing selection of unobservables? I was just using the same logic as, as people use when they try different specifications um, in say a regression context, so you may uh, so oftentimes what applied people do is they they just uh, you know they try different regression specifications controlling for different covariates, and if this estimate is stable, they're going to conclude okay, uh, I'm happy. And so my conclusion here was the same. I was trying different values of C, so you can think of that as trying different specifications for the conditional mean, and the estimate wasn't changing very much, so I was happy. That's all I was trying to say. Um, the, the, the last question I, I want to address uh, very briefly is that there's this uh, uh, key to this, this uh, approach is, is that you have to pick C somehow a priori. And the question is, how do you, how do you pick it? Um, we have some results in the paper that show that it's actually not possible to use data-driven methods without further assumptions um, to choose uh, C in a data-driven way. If you want to construct confidence intervals, the logic is similar to the logic that uh, if you say, do not know what covariates to control for, the best you can do is to control for everything. You cannot, you know, you know, uh, you cannot do model selection in this way um, because, because of, of uh, issues that, uh, that come up with inference after model selection. So accounting for the fact that you could have picked a C in this data room way that, that is wrong um, is, is, uh, is, is so expensive that the best thing you can do is to pick the most conservative C that you can come up with that you think is reasonable ex ante. Uh, but but uh, maybe you can strengthen the conditions on the conditional mean function to get around this. I think that's a that's a um, question for future research. So let me let me stop here. Okay, I think we have uh, time for one more question. So I'm going to uh, unmute Pang Sun. Um. 
while he's trying to log on, I, just a follow up to to your uh, comment about C doesn't changing C that's that's changing the amount of bias, but it's not actually really changing the point estimate, right? Because the point estimate, I mean, if if because you, you're trying to come up with optimal weights, but those may sort of collapse to the same optimal weights, and then as you make C bigger and bigger, it's just allowing more and more bias as you get closer and closer to one to one matching, for example. Well, uh, it does. So, it, so the picture I showed is not that doesn't obtain in 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 all applications. So, it, if you change C, it changes the optimal estimator because it changes the optimal delta. Because if you increase C, the yeah. uh, bias of the original estimator is now larger than you previously thought, and so it's actually in that relative that now you've no longer resolved the bias variance trade-off in an optimal way, and right. so you may want to uh, you you want to adjust uh, the optimal delta. Or, you know, if you're using a matching estimator and you're trying to pick the number of matches optimal, it may be that matching with a single match is optimal if C is very large, but you may want to do more smoothing if C is small. So in the limit when C is zero, when, when the response surface is flat, then it's optimal just to use the difference in means estimator, which is like matching with an infinite number of matches. So, so the estimator changes uh, reflecting exactly the relative bias uh, variance trade-off. Thank you. Did Pong come up? Um, yeah, it seems we're not getting a response. So maybe uh, we'll wrap up for today. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, but first, uh, let's thank all the volunteers today. Uh, so uh, second, thanks, uh, Michal, for a great talk. Thanks, Tim, for helping out in Q&A. Thanks, Luke, for a fantastic discussion. Um, also, thank you, everyone else, for uh, coming and participating. Um, like next Tuesday, we'll have uh, Ji King and uh, Xun uh, speak about the Bayesian alternative to synthetic control for comparative case studies, a dynamic multi-level latent factor model with hierarchical shrinkage. We're all uh, looking forward to, to that next talk. Again, thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you have a nice week and stay safe and uh, see you next time.